It's all good. Uh, chat screen up. Hang on. Chat window. I want to see what I'm doing, so it's going to go down here. All right, chat's up. All right, hey, good morning. This is the second part of part seven. Then we're going to move on to some brand new material that'll be debuting for the first time starting tomorrow, assuming everything works right today. Uh, yes, um, happy pandemic, I guess. Sorry. Um, we were going through trying to tie a bunch of things together, kind of emphasizing key points. And then today is Jeopardy time. All right, so use the chat window, um, answer questions, um, and they're all laying right in front of you. So, you know, um, I, I'll give a little bit of time for everyone to kind of think about the answers the best I can. Uh, certainly for watching on, uh, uh, you're watching the, the replay that, you know, nah. play along though, serious. Um, it's always good if you can answer these kind of trivia questions and you understand it more. All right, see, when you can apply something, you understand it better. So let's just start. We're going to work in layer two. Um, and actually, I'm going to add a bonus question. Bonus question, I'm going to start right at the top. What's your layer one? What is the only thing that really has anything to do with layer one um, in this? And uh, yeah, layer one. Special layer one. IGMP snooping. Well, that's sort of that that goes into the, the question right there. That's your layer one, right? That's the one that is going to keep the traffic kind of answering this what snooping do. Uh, somebody's. Oh, there we go. Um, that's um, that really starts to answer what's that next question? What's it do? Keeps track of things in layer one. Now we, we, we should ask ask that question again in layer two. What's it doing? Okay, then we'll go go into more detail. So we'll do that. Uh, so let's move on to the next question for layer two. PIM or IGMP? Which one are you doing at layer two? This one should be fairly fast. Give you a minute on that one. Yeah, IGMP. PIM is between layer three interfaces. That's how I, that, that's all about routing multicast. IGMP is controlling on that LAN segment. I have, I'm telling a router that I have, I'm interested in that traffic, okay? At layer two, what does IGMP snooping do? And we kind of went over a little bit, but layer two, what's it doing? Well, it's listening for reports. It's going to proxy those reports. It's only going to allow through single reports to the router to keep the, the uh, traffic down, to keep the load down off the router. It's going to listen for leave messages, okay? And then it's going, it's going to do the query Find out, make sure that there are still listeners and not forward that to the router. So the router won't need to do an extra query. It'll do its query on its regular cycle, right? And then the IGMP snooping switch is going to proxy all that stuff. It's going to answer it. Oh, yeah, we still want this group. We still want this group. We still want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want these groups. Great. It's gonna, that's what it's going to do at layer two. It's going to intercept and act as a proxy between, now on its side, by not forwarding um, the report back to a query to the rest of the switch or the rest of the interested hosts, they will also answer the query. Therefore, it can still keep track of every device, make sure that every device that said that wanted that group still wants that group. Now, in a non-IGMP snooping switch, this stuff is getting flooded. And so the difference in that case, in some of these cases, there might, I, some software defect, maybe it's 
something didn't send a report, but gets the here's the query and then replies back to it. It's possible. Yeah, I don't know, but there you go. Snooping layer two. Okay. This one's a little, little more involved here, and I think I kind of gave it away, but a vendor is using this group, 239, 200, right? That is in what part of the range? Yes, administratively scoped. That's the administratively scoped ranges. That's where you are controlling what you do with it. You have free range. No vendor can reserve a piece that, well, uh, that's kind of not true because there's some weirdo stuff up in the high 239, 255 range that is, so SSDP, um, and there's another one of the zero configs that's using ranges up in there, right? But in general, nobody's supposed to do that. They're supposed to be using the lower ranges for the IANA registry, right? Okay, so they have, using that group, they've set a TTL of four. You see the star comma G and the S comma G on the last top router. So, um, that means that you've had an interested host. Must be an RP, I guess, right? Because um, we see the source, we know about the source, but we, we're looking at the flags we, and what command are we using to see this S comma G and, and star comma G? Yes, show IPM route that, um, so you're looking at the flags and you don't see that T flag for shortest uh, path three is set. Um, nor do you seem to be getting any traffic and, and how are you going to troubleshoot this thing? So this will take a little longer to think about this one. And of course, you know, we want to talk about all the different methods. So if some, you know, one answer here is you can, um, certainly one of the things I can do is I can show IP route back to the source, follow, follow it back and doing the show IPM route count. That'll, that'll tell me for sure the traffic's not getting there and I can follow it back. I could see then. And of course, if I follow the path all the way back to the first top router, I, I'm going to see it's more than four hops. So the CTL is a problem. And why do I ask that question? Because a vendor did that. has done that to me more than once, different vendors. So for they make an arbitrarily low setting. If you have a particularly if you have a uh, if your campuses are layer two, so you, you have some sort of collapsed core, say, and um, it's all layer two to that collapsed core, you're keeping your hop count fairly low because there's probably collapsed core to router, something across your WAN, um, a lot of the circuits you're buying. It's it's some sort of VPN. It's a Ethernet Metro Ethernet. It's something that you're keeping the hop, the hop may be only a single hop across this entire uh, WAN. And so the hop count can be fairly low, this may work, but if you start introducing any kind of layer three complexity to it, that's where you run into that problem. So that's one of the ways you can do it. You can certainly go from both ends, okay? Another one is just doing the show IPM route count on the last hop, that may get you curious, everything else seems to be working, you may do a packet capture, right? So grab the packets coming off, the uh, source and that's where you you spot that low TTL value you probably don't know this in advance so that may be where you get it you may actually be you didn't know that information check in check in where's it start working hmm, grab some pack you know you're like that's odd why does it stop working there you're gonna be looking for things like filters uh, ACLs boundary statements um, something that's keeping that traffic from flowing and you and not finding that particularly at that place of failure that's where the packet capture comes in where you're like I, I just gotta see these packets you can do debugs as well I, I should be able to do like uh, uh, in in that document I showed you they walk you through some of debugging the um, multicast packets right so I can see some of that um, as well Let's get on to this one. This one I think is fairly straightforward. Uh, we talked about this a couple of times. When do you need IGMP v3? And it, is it a must have in all cases? Is it a, yeah, and, yeah, and answer a little more. Like, is it a, is it an upgrade? Is it, should I put it everywhere? Is it 
uh, use case specific and even that use case can I have an exception to it. So IGMB V3 is for source specific multicast specifically. Um, it's turning it on, you can turn it on, yeah. It's a, um, you don't need it if you're not doing source specific. Um, it doesn't really add anything that I can, I can think of in anything but source specific. Because um, that's where you're adding, you're now adding that extra, that different group to listen for IGMP V3. And um, I'm looking for includes and excludes, which all my IGMP V2 hosts aren't going to do. So, and even with doing source specific, there are some cheats you can do at the router level, the SVI, where you, or at the global on the switch, where you can do things like, I, I see that group, I'm not looking for includes or excludes, I will, the source, I'm going to find it for you based on DNS. I talked about that one, you do the reverse lookup on the group, there's a special multicast group you're defining uh, in DNS. Obviously you have to turn on DNS resolution on your switch, uh, whatever that layer three, wherever that layer three interface is with that SVI, that you've got to make sure that it can do DNS resolution and it'll go, oh, okay, that's the unicast address that belongs to that sort, to that um, uh, group at IP, okay? Um, I wouldn't turn on if I didn't need to. I, I don't think it adds anything. I think it just, you just add complication. Um, certainly if troubleshooting, if I'm, if this host doesn't need to do uh, IGMP, if this VLAN doesn't need to do any IGMP V3, I would turn it off. Not doing source specific in there, I would fall back to um, IGMP V2, see if that fixes your problem, okay? Now let's talk about layer three, which should have been a hint for that first question, on which interfaces should you enable PIM? And there's some differences of opinion, and this is great. Um, and I, I lay it out, I actually laid it out for you, okay? Um, loop back if and only if you're an RP. You don't really need to do it elsewhere. It doesn't do you any good. So if I'm, um, if I'm a layer three access switch, for example, that, um, so multi-layer, uh, I've got SVIs on and I do a layer three interface up. I don't get really a lot out of doing loopback. No traffic's gonna hit it from not an RP. I can just, um, and of course, a lot of my designs now, really exclusively the designs I work at now, I'll either be doing the next step up distribution or collapse core, whatever it is, is going to be um, either a VSS or it's going to be Nexus and doing VPCs. So there's only one way out that uh, IP that belongs on the, on that port channel is it's, that's where it's going to source from. And if that IP is not available, that port channel is down. So the switch is isolated anyway, so who cares? So yeah, uh, layer three links between devices. So if you're uplinking to your core, you know, between the cores and your routers, um, somewhere across your LAN, you're doing layer three, across your WAN, you're doing layer three. Am I doing MPLS and layer three MPLS? Am I doing some sort of layer two VPN um, across? But yeah, there too assuming I want the traffic to go there, right? So if really my applications are all local to a campus, I may not, I may choose not to turn it on on the way in, okay? And then this one about where hosts might be interested in the traffic. Yeah, that gets interesting. So you can be sort of proactive and being proactive can look one of two ways. And this is gonna, we're gonna talk about this in, in section eight. Uh, part eight, when we can, we do that starting tomorrow, that one of these is, well, it's a user VLAN and there's this application and the, the voice guys never tell me when they act, when they need a, a new workstation running that uh, ACD manager, automated call distribution, um, 
manager. So I'm just going to turn on everywhere. That way, when they do it, I don't get this trouble. I don't get this escalated trouble ticket. This escalated incident saying, "Oh my God, this broken. We need to have someone someone uh, troubleshoot this." You're like, "You never told this, so we never enabled it." Right? There's that thinking, and I understand that well, especially if it's something like you know they're calling you like very beginning of the day or the very end of the day. So you're not even on shift yet, but you're responsible for it or you're, you're the on-call or whatever. So they're getting an on-call page out. And they're like, dude, has this machine ever been here before? No. Did you know it worked? No. Did you tell us you're going to do it again? No. You knew it had needed multicast. You know multicast isn't on everywhere. You needed to tell us. This was not, you're not supposed to page me out, dude. Let me, I'm talking to your boss, right? Happy, happy, happy. Yeah, you can tell I've been there before, right? There you go. See the steam? Yeah, I've been there, done that. That's one way of thinking about it. The second one is, well, the moment I turn on, then anything goes. We were talking about securing how to make anything goes less than anything goes um, in part eight. So you got something to look forward to, right? So there you go. Two ways to think about it, where you might be interested or where they, you know they are, right? And then go back and fix the other ones where you um, didn't know people actually wanted the traffic. Right. But certainly, if you know that the, that they need it and they need to route, right now again, if if for example, um, uh, there are some medical devices uh, I've talked about Philips and Teleview more than once that you can get that as a um, in a hospital. They're often built with an entire Philips infrastructure. Like you'll actually see wall plates. You might go into an exam room and see a wall plate that says something on the plate itself, like Philips Network, something or other. It's actually labeled. I've seen them where it looks like they have them made. Like they're painted on. They're not just like a sticky label. They're like, no, no, this is Philips Network. Leave this alone. This is ours. Okay. And so end to end from medical device wire everything now i you know they didn't necessarily run the wire on the wall you probably had your cable vendor do it if you do this internally you, you guys probably actually ran the wire fine it goes back to switches those go back goes back to servers there's a whole infrastructure on the in, the link between that phillips and the rest of you may not have pim enabled because you don't need it you're not doing any multicast all that multicast is contained inside the network you may not have pim turned on there okay Hopefully that answers it. If we got more questions, you know, that this is great. Well, I remember the yesterday when we introduced this segment, one of the things I asked you was, what haven't you asked yet? So certainly there's some you could ask me that are way beyond the scope of what I'm trying to accomplish here. You ask away. They're great questions. Um, don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but ask away. Uh, but there are other ones like I'm still not really understanding why this okay so oops here we go more on layer three so where do i place boundary statements and you get what a boundary statement is right this is going to stop multicast traffic for particular groups i can say i'm going to allow these groups through and not those groups so from a PIM layer, I go to do a PIM, I'm doing a join and I want to join for this group. At the boundary, it should say, uh-uh, no, no farther, not doing it. And break that link. But you wanted that. This traffic was supposed to say local, um, right? Or this site doesn't, doesn't, you, this is a partner, you are sharing a few things, but this traffic, this particular traffic that has like protected health information, personal identifiable information, whatever it is, like that's in this multicast group. No, 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 you don't get that. Boundaries in place, okay? There's a particular place you're not going to do that, and what's that? That's the next question. And somebody looks like they already answered it, and that is going to be um, on an RP. Why? Because it can make it can make a mess out of the announcements. Now, be careful. Obviously, do your announcements carefully. It's easy to make mistakes. Okay. And what's this filter auto RP? This assumes you're using auto RP, right? Yeah, assumes auto RP. 
I talked about this a couple times as we introduced that the whole boundary concept is that on a, on a boundary, this thing says, look, going outbound, I will excise, I will remove from an announcement for an RP that it's, it does a group that can't pass this filter. So if I'm advertising group 239, 100, uh, 100, zero slash 24 for this campus, that whole range, but I, I only want it on the campus, I put in the boundary statement, deny, boom. And in the, when I implemented the filter, IP multicast boundary, blah, filter auto RP, it will pull that out. I, I can still be authoritative for say 239, uh, 240.0.0 slash 16. That went through, because if that's allowed through the boundary statement but I didn't do it. Um, I did the other pieces just never happened. Nobody learns about it. it. Appears to be one way as far as I understand. Okay. I have a campus range. I use in multiple campuses. Assume we block the range of campus edge. What would happen if I did not block the outer RP announcements for the range? The layer three device on another campus receives that announcement. Take, take a little time with this one, think about it. I know we're kind of running short on time, but I may go over a couple of minutes on this one. Um, we're good with that. So boundaries in place, but not with without the filter auto RP switch. So this gets kind of interesting. So I, I'm at another campus and say, um, I may have implemented correctly with the filter auto RP, but it's only affecting my outbound, not my inbound. So I, I learn about this other RP for reasons of how auto RP makes its choices that I decide that's my guy. I'm using him. So on my star comma G, my incoming interface is gonna point the wrong way, for one. I'm doing joins up to him, or I'm gonna try and do joins up to him and fail. And that other source, now, if the entire campus learn, decides to use the other guy, well, the joins aren't gonna work because of the boundary, for one. But if I have multiple layer three and one guy's using a different RP, we're in deep trouble because what he learns is about sources on the other campus, which can't come through the filter. And he doesn't learn about sources on my campus, which are not getting forward to pass the filter. So it's a, it's a no connect here. So that's why one of the troubleshooting I like to talk about is, um, and I may, have, I may have asked that question uh, later on. Right, so I'm doing the show IP PIM RP mapping a lot, right? Because I want to see that, you know, okay, we're using the same RP, for the same groups, same RP, same groups, same RP, same groups, right? You know, everything I expect the traffic for. One guy has no RPs. Well, what did I do wrong here, right? For auto RP, did I leave off that auto RP listener command? Um, if it's static, that I just neglect to put the static in, right? Um, BSR is pretty foolproof, so if it's in the path, that means PIM's there, it should know about it. And would MSTP help? So first question really is what's MSTP do? So source announced between the two of them? Probably not. Um, maybe, I don't know if the, I don't know if those essays will get filtered by the boundary statement. I'm not sure. It would probably actually make things worse. Because now I have, I'm, I'm going to now start to know about other sources that are across the boundary at best. And I'm going to try and connect with them and I'm going to fail at the, at the boundary. So I'm going to do a lot of work for nothing. So I, I, this is a case where MSCP would not be a great choice. And I haven't looked at looked carefully to see if we can filter MSDP. So if we're gonna filter, assume I'm an RP and I have things that, that I have an MSDP pair, but there are things that are local that I don't want them, um, that I've got filters, right? So, and there's something in between that's gonna do the auto RP filter. So yeah, it'll block that out, but the SAs come across. Can I filter the, S, the source announcements? Maybe, might be worth looking into. Um, it's gonna cause failures. Right. Um, in a lot of those cases, in, if I have like a data center and I have 
I want to have um, an enterprise RP, and then I have some some data center specific ranges. I, I probably will build another RP. Just keep them separate. That way, I don't even have to think about this. That's inside the campus. And if there are some reasons, a big, big dinosaur pen, lots of space, a lot of equipment. And for redundancy, I even have a, I have a pair of RPs for the data center, for these data center specific ranges. Okay, um, I still, may, I may use MSDP to prepare those up, anycast those, and then the enterprise ones are anycast probably across the WAN to another one, some another, another data center. Okay, I announced this range and my boundary as a permit for that. Okay. That's an interesting one. I don't. I think I ran a test on that one. I wish I'd wrote, written down the answer. I may have to run a test on this one. Bad design. This is bad design. I want to announce something, but I don't want to permit a thing through. If I remember correctly, how this worked out was badly. Um, things were getting blocked kind of a little randomly. It's not, it's not pulling this thing out and then create slicing and dicing to make it work for you. I had to go and break up. So if I have um, something like this campus has allowed this range out like that say that's a regional like divisional range at 200 and then different sites have these little ranges where they're that's the groups they're allowed to, to advertise out onto the the divisional multicast um ranges right that's their little chunk of it and it gets kind of ugly where the best thing to do with this is is chop up my announcement so this I'm announcing this range, this range, this range, this range, and then the, uh, the uh, using auto RP, right? And then the filter will allow will block all the other campus ones and allow that one through. It's kind of weird. Is I don't know why you'd want to do that. I'm not quite sure exactly why, but yes, thinking back, this is a couple. Of years, this was years ago. Don't do this. This is really bad. I don't think I went over this ahead of time, but this is a great question. Um, how do I figure out what, uh, which is the RP for a particular group? Actually, I already answered it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Show IP, PIM, RP, space mapping. Now, a dumb one, you you, you make a change and you want to clear out the IP, ma the, that RP uh, cache and, and get it to you know renew. It's not RP space mapping when you do the clear. It's clear IP PIM RP dash mapping. Don't I, I? I'm not a Cisco engineer. I don't know why I do that. Okay. Does source specific use um, multicast use a rendezvous point? Answer is no. Um, and there's one other that doesn't use a rendezvous point, and that is. Dense mode, and sparse dense sort of right. It can have an RP. It can. It might not have an RP, right? Um, but the flavors of dense mode don't. Those are the two that don't. How does he? How does then? How does source specific connect the receiver and source? Right. That's an RP. Do RP running point, point does. Okay. And right, lots. There's lots of different answers. Probably everything someone says is, is uh, going to be right on this one. So uh, it could be out of band. So uh, using IGMB3, I can say, include this. I want this source. Um, it could be, I can do DNS resolution. I talked about that moments ago. Um, it could be things like where I, I do a mapping and I say um, all my source specific, like the, I define the range, say these are the, the ranges, they all go to, send them to this guy. Send them to this unicast. I can do that. So there's some varieties on how you do that source specific. Depends on your application, your particular needs, what makes the most sense. I try not to box myself into a corner. The application has a way, to, and it wants to do things very dynamically, and it has a way to feed it. IGMP3 V3 is probably the best answer. Right? If it's very static, like well, that's the only thing we're going to do it this way. Sure, the idea, I pointed at that box. I'm just going to, 
I'm not even gonna do any kind of heavy lifting. Just you take that traffic, send it there. Just go. Yeah, it's simple. Later on, you may not have to re-engineer that because you're now doing something else that needs to be specific. Just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, we're gonna run a little over, I think. Yeah, we're running a little over. A couple more questions. Maybe about five minutes, um, if you can bear with me. Uh, let's see. Is my layer three, what command am I gonna use? Um, see if I'm correctly connected via PIM. There's a couple ways to do it. There's a lot of good ones. Um, show IP PIM neighbor is a good one. Because if I, I can see, yes, I have a neighbor. I can see my neighbor's IP. I can see that we're using, you know, we've agreed on sparse mode and we're using PIM V2. There's a lot of different things that I can say that, yeah, yeah, that's good. And, and I could check from both sides, right? I really wanna make sure and I can do, right? That's a great way. Um, and mtrace too, yeah, mtrace, absolutely. If it should tell you that PIM's not enabled somewhere. Um, Okay, what commands show me with an interface is interested in a particular group? Good one, good one, good one, like it. We're, I think we're on target here. Show IP M route and you're looking for that star comma G and then you're uh, in it, you're looking, so uh, multi-interface, right? If it's a single, well, single interface, this is kind of nuts. And nothing to do, no routing. But if I see that an outgoing interface list on that star comma G, I know that there's a there's a receiver that's asked for that group. Now it could be a join put on that on an SVI. I could just manually put in a join. I could do that. IP what is it? IP IGMP join group blah. I can do that. Okay. What command will show me that my last app router knows about a particular source? Uh, show IP M route, right? you'll see a star comma G, you'll see, excuse me, an S comma G, IP, an IP unicast address comma group address for the group you want, right? Um, incoming interface points back towards that IP on the, on the unicast routes and last, and there's a special section coming up next, uh, end of this week or getting next week, right? We're gonna talk about that. Um, right, and the outgoing interface is going to tell you all the all the. It should line up the star comma G. Those things were interested in that group. I got a, I got that source. I'm sending it to those interfaces. Okay. Um, what is MSTP? Uh, can it help me see that it's working? What commands can help me see that it's working? You can. It's a show IP MSTP SA cache is one of the big ones. We didn't do a lot on this one, so. I'm, and I can look, okay, we're exchanging source actives, right? I can go look, show IPM on the, um, on the, on, on the other side, the, the other RP, compare it to mine, there's stuff missing, I'm looking at the SA cache, I'm, he's telling me about what's going wrong. Something else is going wrong. We should be seeing that, those exchanges, right? Um, there's also, um, I'll, I gotta look it up. There's also a peer command you can look up. Um, but look, look under your show IP MSTP, you're gonna see some good commands there, okay? I don't think I wrote this question very well, but okay, so the Anycast one. It's gonna be a slash 32 address, right? It's gonna be a single host address. Um, we're gonna stick it in multiple places. We do it for redundancy. And, oh, I know what I meant on the question. Um, what, what did I, you know, what is, what do you do with this thing, what application? Well, redundancy with your RPs. With MSCP, mentioned above, tie them together so they all, they both, they know, well, they all know about each other's sources, right? You can do mesh groups. You can do a mesh of MSDP. And this, um, and the idea is that for like enterprise, I have say two primary data centers. I have the networks out of, out of there. Everybody connects to both of these two data centers. 
it could be active active could be active standby whatever um, say it's active standby and the active goes down well the standby site has the RP knows about the sources it can re it can do a lot of that rebuilding very quickly because it knows it already has a comprehensive view of what's going on so you know new um, uh, I don't have to change any of the RP mappings on any of the um, devices going uh, because that we do we build them consistently that that IP is still authoritative for that group my unicast routing just made a pretty dramatic change if I had a WAN router say like two round two WAN routers and one went to, to pr this primary and one went to the standby, uh, the active and the standby. Well, the standby router, the a route had been through the active router. Now it's going through the standby router. So from my core, all of a sudden, you know, I'm like exit stage left. I'm going that way. I'm not going stage right. But that's as soon as the unicast routing protocol understands, right, this like physical failure, right? All the links drop, right? That router immediately knows the the, the pro active router immediately is sending out some sort of poison reverse, and you know whatever the, for that particular routing protocol, poisoning that route. It's going not not going not going this way anymore. The um, depending on your design, like if it's ERGRP, and I had the uh, the uh, uh, weights just right, that if it if it's a feasible successor um, that I can immediately just push that in I don't have to, but otherwise I you know I I, I put the route in active uh, as soon as that that unicast routing reconverges multicast is back to normal right so that's why it is spend some extra time on that I should really wrap this up uh, I just installed a new RP on the WAN. All of a sudden, it's now acting as the BSR. What did I do wrong? And this one we went over just kind of briefly, um, right? And that's the, the that's the thing I dislike about the standards for BSR. The lowest wins, lowest priority wins, and the default priority is zero. So what I did is that I had priorities values set on my BSR, so I controlled. Who I wanted to act in that role, and I stuck the new one in, and I neglected to put that in. I didn't standardize my change, so in my change instructions, it's like, okay, when you're at, you know, I'm adding a BSR, that this is what it looks like. I do this, it's the command, blah blah blah. I didn't do that. The more you can build this towards a, I can stamp this thing out like, like that, um, like push a button, you know. Auto fulfill, it's done. It's better because then this thing doesn't happen. I'm um, using BSR. Why do I see multiple RPs for the same groups? That's the fun and fundamental part of BSR, actually. The idea is that it's going to tell you about everybody advertising the group, but it's going to show you the priorities. So you're going to use the one with the best priority, the highest priority for an RP. That's how it's going to go. But everyone knows about this stack. So I have four, I have five. There's probably a limit. I haven't looked to see what it is. I'm sure there's a limit. And certainly if I went crazy and I have 20, 48, well, I'm just gonna be sending a lot of packets to deliver all that information. And there's a lot for the, the BSR to keep track of, right? If I have 2,048 RPs. So there's a lot more information everyone needs to keep track of. You know, I have I, I I don't know if Cisco allocated enough memory. This is one of the things. Now we do have a lot more memory, right? But there are better things to be used for than some psychopath deciding I want to have everyone be an RP because that way, if they're for redundancy, there's always a fallback. Like, it's a little nutty, kid. Um, okay, and I went through and I showed some of this thing. Um, you know, what if no neighbor, right? So I showed you IPPM neighbor. There he is. I can come up blank. Um, and this will come up blank. Show IPPM neighbor. Shh, I don't have any. Okay. What? Well, missing PEM statements. Uh, Unicast aren't in the same subnet. 
They can't do a PIM join because they're not on the same subnet. Could be. Um, links physically down. That's always good to check. Right? So if I do like a show IP interface brief, you know, um, and I'll often do like ex pipe exclude unassigned. Then particularly like a, you know, I have a big chassis and I've got some SVIs and I've got a lot of ports. That's great. There's down, 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 down on the uplinks, right? like that or show IP um, or show interface description is one way um, go look for that interface something show that interface okay uh, looking at this one this is this one you obviously see it does not include count right and the things we kind of look for are things like this right so I have a local flag says so this is local to me um, dense mode because this is auto RP Auto RP and then connected, it's local to me, right? Uh, L was the, yeah, actually a connected interface. Pruned, nobody wants traffic because outgoing is null. Nobody actually wants the traffic, so I pruned it. I know about it, I can reactivate it anytime, but I pruned it, okay? So these are one of the troubleshooting tools right there. And um, this incoming interface here, that tells you where the RP is. And Null says, I'm the RP. This guy says, well, where's the sender? Where's that source? Right? And where do I need to send it? So in this case, right, we see the interested um, group or interested in that group are on that VLAN. There's a source. He's on the same VLAN. No other VLANs that are interested in that traffic right now. No other interfaces. Could be a, a layer three physical interface, right? So no, because no one cares. No one wants it, right? And then I showed you this one, uh, six routes. Um, tell me a lot about what's going on. Tell me about groups. Tell me about sources. So there's, a, there's something interested in this group. Right there's so there's one actually a uh, source for that group, and because we're running the MAPI agent and the um, R and the uh, RP, that's why both those groups show up. That guy is running both, right? And then we can take a look at traffic. We actually see real traffic actually happening, right? Is there real traffic? Okay. Back to our picture. We've really gone over this stuff. Um, there's. I'm going to go over starting tomorrow some security measures, right? Particularly one of the first ones is IGMP. Pick that up starting tomorrow. I appreciate you hanging out with me. I'm running long. Um, this take a look at the slides if you're interested. Um, there, this is kind of repetitive, and but except on this last question, what question have you been asked yet? So in comments either on YouTube or on LinkedIn, um, send me a direct message on LinkedIn. Whatever, right? Just reach out. Oh, you know what? I didn't really understand, right? I, I'm going to do things we haven't done yet. I haven't ha kind of touched on IPv6. I'm going to do a, I, I'm going to work on a unit in IPv6. If I think it's worth do, worth showing, I'll do it. Um, we're going to talk about securing multicast next. Okay. Um, wireless, Cisco wireless and multicast. There's a unit on that that, I, that I'm putting together. Um, so, those topics probably want to hold those questions, but other ones that are here, ask about those. Non Cisco, well, I don't know if you can send me the manual too. Maybe I can look at it and try and make some sense out of it. Um, but my experiences in Cisco, I have looked at other other vendors. They do things oftentimes. The fundamentals are absolutely there, right? So those first, particularly those first segments, totally applicable. When we start going, well, this command, all bets are off. No idea how Juniper, how, uh, you know, Foundry, how anybody else does it. And this is the usual. Anyway, thanks for hanging in there. And I'll get these posted uh, later today. Take care.